to them. Children of the night, what music they make. Welcome back to Scored to Death, the podcast, the official companion podcast to the book, Scored to Death, conversations with some of horror's greatest composers. My name is Jay Blake Fischera, and for those of you that are new to Scored to Death, the book was released in the summer of 2016 by Silman James Press. It contains in-depth interviews with 14 renowned composers and is available in both paperback and ebook on Amazon and from other book retailers. The goal of both the book and this podcast is to explore the craft of film scoring and celebrate the amazing composers that do it. On today's episode, I am chatting with a composer who has dabbled in almost all of the major genres of both film and television, including scoring some of the films that I hold particularly near to my heart. He is probably best known for his epic scores for the films Last Starfighter and Remo Williams' The Adventure Begins, but... His eclectic career spans from the iconic sitcom Cheers and the critically acclaimed drama Stand and Deliver to cult classics like The Legend of Billie Jean, Time Stalkers, Good Guys Wear Black starring Chuck Norris, and the kitschy post-Exorcist II Linda Blair vehicle Roller Boogie, as well as the horror fan favorites Fade to Black, Nightmares, and A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master. Today, I'm very excited to welcome Craig Saffin to the podcast for part one of this in-depth two-part interview. Craig, thank you so much for doing the show. Uh, My pleasure. Uh, I'd like to start off by talking a bit about how you fell in love with music and how it became a passion for you. Sure. Well, my mom played piano, so there was always some piano going in our house when I was a little boy. And uh, she played all classical music. But tried to play popular music, wasn't very good at it, and sort of gave up piano altogether. But it was there was always music in the house. And I started just tinkering with the piano when I think I was about four or five years old, and picking out tunes, picking out this and that. And uh, for a while, my mom would uh, give me, you know, lessons, little pointers and stuff. But as I got to be about, I guess, in my about six years, six and a half years old, and was really interested. She said, well, your mom shouldn't teach you to play the piano. You need a real teacher. It's not good to have your mother teach you. So she found this uh, wonderful teacher, Helene Mirisch, who is still a good friend of mine. And my mom never really liked playing classical music and was from a very small town in Texas, Laredo, Texas, which is a teeny little town on the border. And said, you know, nobody really ever wants to hear piano played classical music at a party. Nobody wants you to play classical music at a party. Piano should be fun to play at parties. And so she got me this teacher who taught what they called popular, which meant she was going to teach me how to play standards and show tunes. And I really loved ragtime, even when I was a little boy. I loved like Alexander's ragtime band and that kind of music. So this teacher turned out to be amazing because she taught me to improvise from the very first lesson. But she also had a very strong classical background and is a classical violinist. So it was sort of the best of both worlds. At that time, which was, uh, I guess, the mid-late 50s, she was also involved with the L.A. jazz scene. So she knew a lot of the jazz players. And as I progressed and moved into the world of jazz when I was more in middle school. She would literally transcribe Thelonious Monk or Bill Evans solos. And and this is when you had to transcribe listening to a record. I mean, <laughs> you know, this was even pre-cassette. Yeah. So she could transcribe these things. And, I, so, and we would be improvising on two pianos, you know, Monk things. And then, of course, I went to see Monk and Bill Evans and Oscar Peterson and Hampton Hawes and all these jazz pianists. So I always had a lot of varied interest in different musics. I had I loved ragtime. That was the first thing I played. Then I played jazz. Then as I got a little older, 
and the Beatles came around and I got a little more in that high school age. I had to play rock and roll. So at one time I had a rock cover band in high school and had a jazz quartet or jazz trio in high school. And uh, at the same time, um, my dad loved show tunes. So I listened to all the Rodgers and Hammerstein and A. Burroughs, Frank Lesser, you know, all those. So, so I, I had a huge, a, a very wide musical background when I was young. The only thing I didn't really do was classical music because my mom had stopped playing altogether and I had no interest in classical music. However, when I was, I guess in about 12, there was a TV show on that Leonard Bernstein did. So he had a show about music on television, believe it or not. And I was remember watching it and then reading his book called The Joy of Music. And he talked all about Stravinsky's The Rite of Spring. That was his big deal. So the first classical record I ever bought was The Rite of Spring. And that was sort of where I began my musical, <laughs> classic musical education. I never heard Mozart. I never really heard Beethoven. I just went straight to The Rite of Spring. So that, that was sort of my background before college. Yeah. And this, did you pursue music in college? Well, by the time I was at the end of high school, I was really, really a good pianist. And I stopped taking lessons, but I had my bands. And at that point I was writing songs. And when I went to college, I never felt uh, like I wanted to become a classical musician. And I was at a liberal arts college and I was an art major. So I became an art major. I thought I'd be an architect. I was also a painter too. I painted, I drew, I did lettering. So I was sort of all around artsy kid. And in college I was an art major, but I would write songs and I could go into the practice rooms. I'd write songs. I wrote four or five original musicals. And then they had this wonderful room in the music department, which was electronic music. And they had what was called a Buchla system. You may be familiar with that. Yeah. What year is this? Around what year is this? This was late 60s. And so these were, um, there were two basic music systems, the Moog and the Buchla, and neither of them were made to be able to play actual melodies. They were totally invented to make sounds because that they came from the classical world of sound production, music concrete. The idea of playing a tune with them was like just the worst possible thing you could do. Yeah. And so until Moog, little at the end of the 60s, early 70s, actually put a keyboard to one of these things, they were pretty much just for avant-garde music, but I was fascinated and spent untold hours in the electronic music studios in college. So I got into that. Also then in college, I started listening to a lot more classical. I wanted to figure out how all that stuff was put together. So I took orchestration class. I at one point thought, well, boy, you should really become a music major. And so I was going to transfer from the art department to the music department, but I took like a couple of the prerequisite music courses and they were so lame because they were teaching me basic harmony. But I mean, I had been playing Bill Evans and Thelonious Monk when I was, you know, 12 years old. So yeah, I was totally not interested, but there were some good teachers there. Alvin Lucier was one of the greats who was into music as sound. He was like sort of like an on-gauge kind of guy. And uh, I learned how to orchestrate, and I started listening to a lot of classical music and buying the scores to figure out how the orchestras were all put together. So I did all that on my own, basically. So I had the scores from everything from uh, Beethoven to Stravinsky to Penderecki <laughs> to Crumb. You know, uh, again, I, I, I've always been very eclectic in my tastes. So musically, I've gone from every style pretty much yeah and how did pursuing a career in not only music but 
film scoring? How did that come about? Well, that was sort of accidental. So by the time I graduated high school, I knew I wanted to do music, but I wasn't sure what. I just thought, well, I'll be the Beatles. You know, that was sort of like how everybody felt back then. <laughs> yeah. And I was given a fellowship by the Thomas G. Watson Foundation. And I went to London and just got involved with pop opera and I got involved with electronic music. But what I did for the my year in London was I spent a huge amount of time writing songs. And uh, I, I wrote just hundreds of songs and got really good at it. Also, when I was in college, I was asked to put strings on a few record albums because nobody else could, I could actually write music down. And so I had some friends who were making record albums, one for Warner Brothers, and, and I ended up doing the string charts. So when I came back to LA, I wasn't sure how I would make a living after my fellowship, but I just started, you know, hanging out, writing songs, getting a few jobs, making writing lead sheets up for copyright, got a few gigs arranging records. I did something for Emmy Lou Harris and a few other people. And I sort of fell in with this gang of uh, young musicians uh, that were centered around this recording studio called Clover and made demos, wrote songs, played with my brother as the Saffin Brothers, barely scraped by if that, worked two, three days a week selling jewelry at my dad's store. And then one day, I was probably about 24, 25 at the most, I get a call from a person I knew at my college, and she said, I've gotten married. My husband's out. We just moved here to AFI, American Film Institute, and he made a Super 16 horror film. And you're the only person I know in Los Angeles who's a musician. Do you know someone who could put music to this thing? And I just said, I'll do it. (laughs) And that was my first film. And I had never really thought of doing film music before. It just sort of, I did it. I did the music. And it was so much fun that at that point I went, well, this is what I have to be doing. I mean, songwriting is nowhere near as much fun as this. Plus, I'm not making any money where I can't, I'm just not writing hit songs. That's not what I do. And, you know, arranging record albums is just too iffy. So I just fell in, I just started pursuing it. And what happened was that this little group of musicians at Clover Studio in the 70s, uh, one of the, my friends was Andrew Gold, whose father was Ernest Gold. Another one of my friends was Peter Bernstein, who played bass, who's still one of my best friends. And his father was Elmer Bernstein. And the other was a young woman named Wendy Waldman, whose father was Fred Steiner, who wrote the Perry Mason theme and Rocky and Bullwinkle. I sort of looked and went, hey, your dads do film music, don't they? So I, so I contacted Elmer and Ernest and Fred, and they, the three of them became my mentors. Yeah. They invited me to all the sessions. They showed me stuff. Ernest gave me some composition lessons. Fred was a real academic, and we used to watch 16 millimeter movies in his house and he'd get he'd get his hands on the original score to uh the 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 actual music for like king kong by max steiner and we'd watch it at his house and look at the score while we were watching it so wow they were great and then elmer just invited me to all the scoring sessions and that of course was a great education what are some of the sessions that you remember most fondly the one that i remember the most was the shootest That's the one I really remember. Uh, that was a John Wayne movie. Yeah. And uh, Elmer did it. And I just learned, first of all, I learned how a composer can be abused by a producer, which happened on the session. And I thought, man, if Elmer, if, if Elmer Bernstein has to take this crap, none of us are safe. <laughs> yeah. And then I, then I also learned really what film music was about because – there was a scene in the movie where, uh, towards the end, where there's like a 
a sort of a shootout in the in a bar and there's a fire and Ron Howard's in it and John Wayne and the bartender and a couple other people. And it's a complex scene because part of it's in one room, part of it's figuring out how the danger is, the other is who's behind the bar. And it was sort of a mess. And the minute that Elmer put music to it, music told you exactly where you were, what the stakes were, what point of view you were at. It clarified all this uh, visual complexity. And I just saw, wow, that's, you know, because I used to sort of think, well, film music is about writing really good original music. Yeah. And then I realized that's not what film music's about at all. The originality or the, it isn't the number one thing. The number one thing is helping your film. Is it clarifying your film in one way or another? I would like to talk a little bit about your process. Sure. And of course, all situations, you know, every situation I'm sure is, uh, you know, differs, but in an ideal situation, when you come onto a film or you've done a lot of television also, but so when you come onto a film and you meet with the director or the producer to discuss, you know, what you're going to do on the film, what ideally are you looking for from the director? Like what information do you have a set of questions that you've found that you ask a lot, stuff like that? Not really. I, th I think the, the biggest issue is going to be how much work have they already done on the music? So back when I started, it was pretty hard to do a temp score because it was all done physically. You actually, you actually had to literally cut tape. Yeah. You know, sprocketed tape. And so the only thing that was ever really tempt were montage scenes, you know, that, that needed the rhythm of the music. But of course, now it's like just child's play to put together a, a temp score on a computer. It takes, you know, there's nothing to it. Yeah. And pretty much every music in the world is available instantaneously on the web or in your iTunes. And so the problem really is, is, if there is a ver if they've already spent two months cutting this thing and put a temp track that they love, how do you go against that? You really can't. Yeah. So I think that's one of the reasons you don't see as many interesting scores because the composers sort of already come in with a lot of rules attached. Mm hmm Ideally, the way I would do it, so let's say, I don't know, a movie like Stand and Deliver. I'd say, well, okay, I want it to be Latin, but I don't want it to be obviously Mexican. I usually will sort of talk with the director and then choose a palette. I really believe that the, one of the first things to do is to go, okay, this is going to be guitars and pan pipes and synths. And all the percussion is going to be, I'm going to invent all the percussion. I'm going to record it all myself using things I find in a hardware store. Okay, that's sort of how Stand and Deliver happened. And I just sort of gave myself that palette. So it's sort of the same way an artist, like if you think of, Picasso, okay, it's his blue period. He's only painting using blues, you know, or you're only painting in a Cubist style. So to me, each film, you sort of want to pick your, your sound palette and pretty much stick to it. And that really gives you the bones of a good score. Yeah. So that's the first thing I do. A lot of conversations with the director. A lot of times the director will attempt some of it, so that gives you a, a good clue. Uh, a movie like The Last Starfighter. It, you know, you, we were in that era of the John Williams score, so for me to really do anything different than that big romantic score would have gotten me fired immediately yeah so you know there's there's a lot of that sort of just the realities of the business so in something like that i go well how can i do that big romantic orchestral score and sort of make it mine and so i sort of figured out a few ways to do that to make it individual so it didn't just sound like a cookie cutter john williams score but every film i do has a certain sound to it 
I would imagine that some films, that sound palette comes to you easier than others. Yeah, probably. And some are just more generic. I mean, some you just want a, you know, an orchestral score that's sort of late romantic orchestral score, like 8 million other scores. And that's sort of what works with the film. But, but generally, I would try to do something that was a little more interesting or that had, you know, some twist to it. Do you find the script to be a useful tool? Not really. I think the script can be very misleading because as a composer, you really have to respond to what you see on the picture. It's really um, a physical response in terms of the groove of the picture, how, how it's playing, how it feels, how the actors are, what it looks like. The script can be very misleading, especially musically. Yeah. So no, I don't, I don't think that's usually a, a good way to do it at all. Do you find that you kind of work through the film writing music kind of in order or do you watch the film and see key scenes that you kind of start with and then branch out from those? Well, I think the way I do it is that I look at the whole film and I sort of get the idea of the kind of music and I listen to what they are, they already have in the film or what they like. And I'll start writing a bunch of themes or maybe one theme or a few, you know, a few sketches but then when I actually write it, I found over the years that it's better to write not to do the main title first, huh. to sort of do some cues that are a little more throwaway, that are going to be not as obvious. I mean, you know, a lot of music is going to play underneath scenes, and you're not going to even notice it's there, but it still has to be written. And I sort of can get my feet wet there and get the sounds right and get get the, the feelings right and work out problems. Then I go back and I'll do the main title. When, so I, I'll do the main title after I really have a stronger feeling of what the music is. Because the main title is going to be something that people will hear usually. I would imagine this is something you get better at as you get more experience. But in the beginning, did you find that it was sometimes difficult to think of the score as a whole when you're concentrating on you know, little aspects of it with specific scenes and stuff? Like, is it hard to keep continuity, kind of? Well, I think if you pick your sounds, it isn't. Because it's like if you go, okay, this is going to be like a pastiche of cinema noir, you know, with those sounds or the solo trumpet and, you know, like Chinatown or something, you know. That, in a way, is giving it continuity. And then you're just writing to the film. So the film is sort of dictating your continuity in many ways. Occasionally, though, like you may want to write, like I remember when I did the first episode of Cheers, I wrote a lot of music. And then the producers came back and said, you know, we don't really, we don't want a lot of music. We don't like that. We, we just want you to connect the scenes, basically. <laughs> You know, so so there's certain genres that like sitcoms don't like underscore very much. They're right. All those guys are writers. They just want to hear their words. You know, whereas just the opposite happened. I did an amazing stories, and it was uh, I think Matthew Robbins directed. No, Danny DeVito directed it. So Danny directed this uh, episode of Amazing Stories, and Danny comes from sitcoms. You know, he did Taxi and all that, and then his wife Rhea did Cheers. And so I, when we looked at the film and spotted it, it was like, okay, I don't want music here. I don't want music here, Craig. Right here, right. So I wrote music. And then, of course, the executive producer was Spielberg, who likes lots of music. And he made me go back. And actually, after I had recorded it, he made me go back and add another 50% more music. <laughs> because, you know, it was just two different points of view of how these films, of how music works yeah you know danny did not like a lot of music in originally in those films i wrote a book called uh, scored to death conversations with some of horror's greatest composers and i interviewed 14 different composers and sure. now i've been interviewing several composers for this and but i found that there's kind of two camps of composer that i've found so far which is some composers can watch the rough cut or whatever mm -hmm. and 
instantly start hearing music. And then it almost becomes like a dictation process where others have to sit down with it and kind of improvise until they find something that they feel works and then they go from there. How is it that you work? Well, I hear things pretty quickly, but I think I'm, I move to the second scenario in that I like to sit with the film and play with it and try different things and see what really works. But it doesn't take very long. I mean, it's sort of like, but it isn't dictation. And it, it's more like uh, focused improvisation is how I would say. So I can improvise the score, but I've already know my themes and I already sort of know what I'm looking for. And I get the sort of general feeling of the film of what, what it needs. And then I improvise from there. Yeah. You know, this is a, you know, this could be considered a spiritual question or a science question, but where do you think that inspiration comes from when you see something and you start hearing things? I have no idea. I, th I think honestly that when I write music, I just, a part of my brain totally just is free and lets the music just come. And then I have another part of my brain that's watching it so I can write it down and edit it. It's almost like I split into two people. And one of them is like the sort of creative one and the other one is sort of like, okay, that was good. Let's write that little thing down. Or that's good. Let's save that. Let's repeat that. So it's like a back and forth between that. But I think you have to have this sort of freedom where it comes from. I have no idea. But if you write music or when I write music, it's like the day passes so quickly and I almost have no memory of doing it. I don't remember writing it. So, uh, and I don't, re and I can't even remember, I can't even play it most of the time unless I look at the notes. So it really just sort of flows through me in a way. I mean, I guess you could look at it like it does flow through you, but that may be just too, a little too metaphysical. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you do have to, you do have to really just let yourself go and just be unedited. And I have a lot of facility on the keyboard and I have a lot of ideas musically constantly that are interesting to me, sound ideas. Yeah. And, and I have a lot of background. I mean, I know a lot of music. So I would imagine that you don't run into things like writer's block and stuff very often. No. I don't know that you can have writer's block and make a living as a film composer. I'm not sure you can do that. Maybe people do, but I don't know anyone who does. I mean, some people maybe have to work harder or work more hours, but if you have a lot of writer's block, I don't see how you can do your deadlines. I uh, would love to talk about the score for the film Fade to Black. <laughs> Oh, okay. That's going back. <laughs> Just a couple of years. Yeah. Uh, how did you come to work on that film? You know, you're asking me these questions I don't remember. That's okay. Uh, the director... Vernon Zimmerman? Yeah. So the director was basically kicked off of it. I don't think I ever met the director. I think I was hired by Erwin Yablons, who was the producer. Uh -huh. I honestly don't remember how I got the job. But I remember, but I mean, I remember the job. I mean, I remember the music. I like the score a lot, actually. Yeah. I still think it's a really cool score. So I was pretty young and it had a lot of sort of pastiches of old movies. The character sort of reenacted bits from old movies. Yeah. It wasn't a huge budget, but I wanted to use a lot of synth in it. And the synth was all live and a small string section because I really wanted that sort of Bernard Hermony kind of horror sound. But what I really wanted was the feeling that your head was stuck into the instruments. So I close mic'd all the piano sounds and put these giant reverbs on them. So you almost feel like you're inside of the piano.
I did the same thing with the harp. Uh, the percussion was super close mic'd. The strings, I wanted to hear the bow scraping on the strings. So it has this sort of really close up intense sound. I don't think there were any woodwinds or brass on it at all. I think it was just strings, percussion, piano, harp, and Michael Boddicker and the synth. <laughs> we may have done a couple of overdubs of the synth. But that was the idea. The idea was to sort of make it, like, to make the sounds like you, like, you, like you were inside of these instruments. So they were not recorded like you're listening in a concert hall from the stage. They're recorded like they're in your ear. Yeah. And that, and that was what I was going for. I loved all that sound. Yeah. Did Aurelia Blands give you any indication, or were you really just left up to your own devices? I was totally left to my own devices. I, there was no direction whatsoever. I think the film was sort of in trouble. The director, I can't remember exactly why, but but it it's, it happens more frequently than you may think. But the the director was out of the picture at that point, and it was just really on the producers uh, to finish the movie. Yeah, and so they really just let me do what I wanted to do. I mean, I don't think they ever even heard anything. I don't think they heard a note before I recorded it and that was before you could do mock-ups you know there were no mock-ups of, of films then i mean because this is still fairly early on in your career yeah very uh i would imagine at least if it was me i would imagine that i would have insecurities that maybe i'm not doing what they want well i never really had those insecurities so my insecurities really were basically you know, everyone has insecurities, but I think there were two things. Once I, I was doing Cheers, and I'm, you know, I was on Cheers forever, but I was doing these movies at the same time. But I remember at an award ceremony or something, meeting up with the producers of the Cheers, of Cheers, and saying, "Do you like what I'm? Is it okay what I'm doing?" And they said, "Well, Craig, of course it's okay. You would know if we didn't like it. We'd tell you." So number one, people don't tell you if they like it. They really only tell you when they don't like it. Yeah, yeah. That's number one. And number two, eventually I just came to the conclusion that, you know, you're making a living doing this. You're getting work. You know, may not always be the, the best film in the world, but, you know, there's some good ones, some bad ones. But you're doing enough right that you're making a living. So just don't worry about it so much. What do you, you know, yeah. what are you going to do? You can't control the outside plus people don't know how to talk music anyway especially back then when there when there were no temp tracks they they would have no way of even expressing what they'd want because they don't they don't have the language yeah you know so maybe they'd play me not that they did they didn't play me anything but let's say they would say okay well here's psycho we love this you know or here's chinatown jerry goldsmith sure we love this and you go, oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah. I can do something like that. And then, but that would be it. So you wouldn't be copying it. But I think in terms of insecurity, it's like writer's block. You just have to not worry about it if you're insecure. You just have to do it as best as you can. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But if you, if, but if you have a career, you're doing enough right that you that, that's good you see <laughs> yeah. if you're making a living that's good yeah you're doing something right okay <laughs> for this score you brought up bernard herman yeah it's a name that comes up almost in every chapter of my book and has come up a few times sure. on the podcast what do you think it was about him and his music that was so influential for like the thriller and horror genres like what what is it that was he, it's like did he just do it the most efficient way <laughs> or is there something else going on? I don't think it's efficiency, but I think it's, well, it's two things. Number one, the first thing I talked about, which was picking your palate. So there's no better example than Bernard Herrmann, except maybe then later Jerry Goldsmith of someone who is going to find a certain sound and give themselves huge limitations for a score. So if he's doing, I don't know, I think it was Jason and the Argonauts or one of those, there are no strings.
Okay, I'm going to do this big giant mythological movie about Jason and the Argonauts with all these monsters. I'm not going to have strings. I'm just going to have woodwinds and brass and percussion, right? Or I'm going to do Psycho. Well, I'm not going to have any woodwinds. I'm not going to have any brass. And I don't even know if there was percussion in that. I don't think so. I'm just going to do it with strings. And so I think he just was sort of great at picking these colors because what really make I mean Psycho is a great score but one thing that makes it a great score is that it doesn't sound like any other score it's only string it's just the string orchestra yeah you know I mean that limits you you're basically using one fourth of the palette you're painting in black and white that's it yeah so in terms of other things I really don't know he just was very very inventive and he had a good feel for the film. I mean, it was it would be very interesting to watch, going back to Psycho, uh, watching some of those scenes of Janet Lee. I think she was in a motel room, just pacing back and forth and wondering what to do. I mean, all she's doing is walking back and forth in a room. But once you put the music on it, it's like, oh, my God, now, <laughs> you know, what's going to happen now? She stole this money. But she's a good girl. But why did she steal the? What's she going to do? And you know, and but the visual is nothing. It's like walking from one end of a room to another and looking pensive or worried. You know, it's like yeah, yeah. So the music really just captured the nervousness. But that's what music does. It it gets right to the subconscious and right to the interior of the character. And he was he was great at that. You also did one cue for a movie that I love and a soundtrack that I love, which is Thief by Michael Mann. <laughs> That's become like its own mini empire, that thing. <laughs> people love that cue. What do you think it is about that cue that people love so much? I have no idea, but it's like all over the internet. You know, it's all over YouTube. It's, I constantly get comments. It's been released a bunch of times. People love it. Uh, <laughs> you know, my daughter told me uh, she was out on a date, and she said, oh, did your dad write that cue for me? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like... Kids love it, and uh, I don't really know why. It was a, a quickie, Tangerine Dream had done the music. But you have to remember Michael Mann, the director, is one of these directors who, if he could write the music, he would. Yeah. If, you know, he wants to do everything. He's a, he's a total, total con control freak. And he actually had the Tangerine Dream music and he on multi-track, and he took all the tracks apart and just put them all back together how he wanted to. Um, and he was very unhappy with the ending of the movie. It wasn't working, and which is basically about a seven-minute scene of people killing each other and shooting, and yeah, you know all that. And James Caan. So it's a very cool movie. And so the music editor was Bob Batham. He was a friend of mine, and he suggested he he hired me. I mean, Michael Mann, Mann wanted to get Jimmy Page to do something the guitar player, but couldn't, couldn't get it. And they didn't have the time and they, it was impossible. So he said, look, I just want this big rock and roll guitar. So I said, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. <laughs> and I think the trick of it was how little I wrote. So it's almost eight minutes of music, which is a lot of music in a film. That's a long piece of music, but I can't, I think it's eight minutes, but I'm not sure. Maybe it's a little less. But anyway, the, 
the thing is that I learned because I had started by doing pop music and never not classical music. It's impossible to write out notes for a rock and roll band. Yeah. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. If you try to write out what the drums are playing or what the guitar is playing or what the bass is playing, it sounds stupid. Yeah. It, it sounds manufactured. It doesn't. It's not rock and roll anymore. It's not rock and roll. <laughs> it's not authentic. It loses everything about rock and roll that you love. Yeah. It becomes bad music. So I knew that. I'd figured that out. But you still need to write something. So all I wrote was like a chord progression, very simple. I wrote one melody, and that was it. And I just basically would write notes. Okay, here, make it more complex. Here, make it darker. Here, make it louder. And we literally just played it a bunch of times. There's one melody that dun, 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 dun. And it was just what I think of as dying dinosaur music because when I think, when I used to hear those big guitars, you know, that would just fill up giant spaces, it just sounded like these huge dinosaurs dying, <laughs> these giant guitar sounds, you know, whether it was Jimmy Page or it was The Who or, you know, whatever band it was. Yes, the band, yes, all those bands. And, um, so I just found great players, and uh, we did it live. And we just did a bunch of takes of it. I just had written in the music sort of how to build it and where I wanted the melody and where I didn't care. So maybe I'd write eight bars of the melody. But the thing is, the chord pattern, which I think is only four chords, never changed. It's the same chord pattern for the entire piece, it just keeps repeating itself. Yeah. Which again makes it feel more authentic because the more sort of complications you add, the less it feels like rock and roll. I mean, when I really came of age in the late 60s, it's like, you know, none of those people could read music who played in the band. At least I don't think they did. You know, I mean, when, I mean, the, the only people that were super musical were the Beatles. But but all the other bands were just playing three or four chords. Yeah. Even the Stones had to sort of catch up with that. They were only playing a couple of chords. And and that that's what rock and roll was. So I would never overcomplicate it. So it's extremely simple. It's really powerful. The melody is sort of cool. And the, the visual is really great. You know, Michael had that a very unique style visually that he then took to like Miami Vice and things like that. Yeah. So, but why it became popular or why people even heard it, I have no idea. <laughs> well, it's just one of those oddities. Yeah. Well, you know, he had, especially then he had a tendency to showcase the music. That's true. There are no, there's basically no sound effects. Yeah. I mean, there's gunshots, but there's nothing else. And I remember when I've done other movies where the sound effects just, obliterate the music yeah. but in that but that it was almost like let's drop the sound effects and just have these wonderful visuals and the blood splattering and this huge rock and roll guitar <laughs> you know well uh, since you brought it up let's talk a little bit about kind of the struggle that you guys have with the sound designers and sound editors and also like how do you guys work together to try to achieve the best result. Yeah, well, I think it's just sort of inevitable that there are different styles that uh, directors go through. I think right now the style is that the score is basically another sound effect. And often it's hard to even know that there's score there. I mean, certainly in the Christopher Nolan movies, it's really, you know, like Dunkirk, It's uh, which I love that score, but it's, Hard to know it's a score a lot of times. Is yeah, it sound yeah. effects? Or even the Batman movies he did was similar. You know, are those sound effects? Is that a score? Is that an orchestra? Is that a mixture? And I think that's the way, that's sort of how it is. I think on some of the movies, like when we mixed The Last Starfighter, there were huge, you know, whenever you have these outer space things, these, there's a lot of big sound effects because of all the rockets and the guns and all that. And we just sort of, 
work together, you know, with the mixers. Ultimately, I'd go, you know, I can't hear the music here, or, you know, or, you know, it's it's ultimately the director who has to find the the balancing point in in some scenes the music maybe seems more important and some the effects do. But now it feels like the effects have pretty much taken over almost all the music. But not in like the shape of water, that's not really true. You really hear the score in that. Yeah. Okay, that's about the midway point and probably a good place to stop for now. I, of course, need to thank Craig Safin for being part of the show. Please come back in two weeks for part two of this fascinating interview, when we will dive deeper into his film work and discuss The Last Starfighter, Remo Williams' The Adventure Begins, A Nightmare on Elm Street 4, The Dream Master, and much, much more. If you've been enjoying the podcast, the book Scored to Death, Conversations with Some of Horror's Greatest Composers is available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and many other places you buy books. Or you can order a signed copy from me directly. Just contact me through scoredtodeath.com or find me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Scored to Death. Scored to Death, the podcast, is now available on most podcast apps and distribution sites, as well as on SoundCloud and YouTube. Please consider subscribing, rating, and reviewing the show on iTunes or on whichever provider you use to listen to podcasts. Ratings and reviews will help the podcast get recommended to potential listeners and raise awareness for the show. My other podcast, Saturday Night Movie Sleepovers, can also be found on iTunes, Google Play, and most places you find podcasts, and on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Sat Sleepovers. You can find Craig on CraigSaffin.com. And I should note that the short clips of music used in this podcast were used strictly to put aspects of the interview into context, to audibly illustrate specific points discussed, and for educational purposes. The soundtracks discussed on this episode were Fade to Black, which is available on CD from Perseverance Records. Stand and Deliver is available on both vinyl LP and CD from Verez Saraband. The Last Starfighter can be found on Vinyl LP from its original release from Southern Cross Records and on CD from Entrada. Thief by the band Tangerine Dream. Craig's Q, titled Confrontation, is not featured on every release of this score, but you can find it on the Vinyl LP from Audio Fidelity and Elektra and on several CD reissues, including the Perseverance Records, Orange Records and Wounded Bird Records releases. Psycho by Bernard Herrmann has most recently been reissued on vinyl LP by both Stylotone and Doxy Cinematic. And Jason and the Argonauts by Bernard Herrmann can be found as a re-recording on CD from Entrada. Thank you so much for listening to Scored to Death, the podcast. And please come back in two weeks for this interview's exciting conclusion. (laughs) 